I want to bring in my next guest, Ryan Payne. I think he is with me. He's the president of Payne Capital Management. Uh, Ryan, good to see you this morning. So let's talk some snowflake 40%. here. I know you cover the tech sector. Uh, the biggest IPO of the year, a ton of demand. What do you think? Well, I mean, first off, nice to see some activity down there on the exchange. It's been a while. And yeah, I think this is just indicative of where we are right now. And it's big tech just keeps getting bitted up here, Kristen. So at $33 billion, like you said, the biggest tech IPO of the year on a company that you said as well makes no money. <laughs> you know, So it's always good to remember that uh, you know, as these stocks and these valuations keep going up, uh, that at the end of the day, the earnings on these companies in some cases are nil. And I think that's a bigger long-term concern, but shorter term, clearly, to your point, there's a big market for any sort of growth that's out there. And this company has had phenomenal growth. Mm -hmm. Uh, $402 million in sales, Ryan, for the 12 months ended at the end of July. We know Berkshire Hathaway, Salesforce, they're collectively investing $500 million at this IPO price. Does that provide you optimism that we could see an initial day pop because investors are hungry for growth? I mean, yes, as a day pop, absolutely, because I think the one thing you're seeing right now is retail activity in the market is at some sort of record highs, right? I've seen stats around 20% to 44% of the retail investors driving the market right now. You start looking at a lot of these platforms like Robinhood, uh, Schwab's trading platform, and speculation is running wild right now, Kristen. And I think that will continue because as the stock market goes higher and higher, these tech stocks become more casino-like by the day. Mm. I know that is a big concern, Ryan, and you accurately uh, called on our air just a few weeks ago that this tech sector needed to get some of the froth worked out of it. Last week, the worst week for the NASDAQ, going back to March in the depths of the lockdown. When it comes to big tech, do you think we need to see more of a sell-off? I think we do, but we're not going to get it. Um, I think short term, the speculation is going to continue to drive markets higher, specifically tech higher. You know, at the end of the day, Kristen, we still have a ton of cash on the sidelines. You know, consumers are sitting with three trillion dollars. That's two trillion more than they had at the beginning of the year. And what we're starting to see is a lot of that money's finding its way into the stock market and it's finding its way in a very, very speculative way. So I don't think that's over. And I think that momentum trade is a real thing. And I really think this is analogous of 99, 2000. And you're right. I did say that the tech sector needed to pull back a little bit and it did. But I think this bubble has not burst yet. But I think it's still a bubble, and when it ends, it's going to end very, very badly, Kristen. Right, that is the concern, uh, that if we don't get another healthy pullback by about 10%, Ryan, I've heard that as well, uh, that we could see an even deeper crash ahead, uh, despite these being companies like Apple, Google, uh, Amazon, and not your pets.com that we saw during, the fight, uh, during, of course, the dot-com bubble back in the 2000s. I mean, Potentially, how risky is this? How much could the market, the tech sector crash if we don't see a healthy correction? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I went back to 99, 2000 just to look at what the market momentum looked like back then. And it's kind of crazy. When the market finally sold off, the NASDAQ lost five years worth of returns. Now, that's a long way down uh, when you think about it. And furthermore, it took the NASDAQ 15 years to break even from its March 2000 high. So I think the problem here is, yes, the momentum can keep going, you know, maybe have some money in tech because, yes, the speculation is high right now and markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. But I think the big picture is you're probably better off being out early in tech than being late, because if you're late, you're going to get punished severely. And I always look at Cisco as kind of the iconic company. Uh, that was a good company, you know, was a company making money back in 2000. It's never gotten back to the price that it had in March of 2000, 20 years later. And there's no reason a lot of these tech stocks are going to be in the same position. They may make money at some point, companies like Snowflake, but so much good news is priced into these stocks, Kristen. Years worth, decades worth of good news is priced into yeah. these stocks that just can't end well at some point. Okay, uh, that's a pretty big warning sign. Uh, Ryan, if I've ever heard one, and I know you've been a huge bull, um, well, certainly before the pandemic, but even at times during this pandemic on the stock market movement. I want to pull up a full screen. These are the other IPOs that we are awaiting. Unity Software, a gaming developer's platform, that's going to make its debut later this week. Another hotly anticipated IPO plus Sumo Logic, uh, JFrog, and then Snowflake today. Could take a while for Snowflake to actually open uh, just as we get the demand and the supply settled 
field here. In terms of these IPOs, you mentioned profitability is missing. What does that mean for these offerings and what does it mean for the broader market? Yeah, I think it actually puts it like a tail of two markets here. So these companies, based on momentum, right, they could probably continue to go higher here. I think that's realistic. As you mentioned, I've been bullish since the bottom. So, you know, basically, you know, I've been pretty much saying that, look, V-shaped recovery, which we've seen here in the economy and the stock market. And the beautiful thing about right now is there's so much good value in the market if you diversify. If you're not looking for instant gratification, if you look at the valuation difference between large cap growth companies and traditional boring cyclicals and value companies, which trade more like, I don't know, 16, 17 times earnings versus like 30 times earnings for these uh, growth stocks that just continue to go up. And these value companies have great dividends and basically their growth prospects are tied to the economy reopening. Mm -hmm. So as an asset allocator like me, this is like a dream come true because I can allocate capital, diversify it and diversify it globally right now. And I'm getting great dividends and I'm getting valuations that are so much cheaper, cheaper than tech mm -hmm. that you've just got a great opportunity right now to buy into the market and not buy expensively mm -hmm. if you're selective. Okay, um, I'm glad you're giving us uh, this insight, uh, Ryan. Of course, I know you manage your, um, you have got your own assets under management with your firm paying capital management. I'm just wondering the state of the U.S. economy. When we look at economies around the world, are you concerned at all that we still have high COVID cases here and places like China are reopening? Does that jeopardize the U.S. stock market when we consider perhaps opportunity abroad? Do, do international stocks basically look more attractive? I think they do on a relative basis if you look at valuation, and it's kind of first in, first out here. If you look at it, China and Europe were first in with this pandemic, and they're first out. I and mean, if you look at global PMIs, uh, manufacturing is up. Uh, also, services are up over 50 again, which means they're in expansion, which bodes very, very well for the U.S. as well, because at the end of the day, coronavirus cases are still way down from where they were in the summer when we had peak cases, or I guess April was the peak peak. But, you know, the point is, you know, things are getting better. What the market cares about at the end of the day is, not, is just, are they getting better? Are they getting worse? And the bottom line is the economic data continues to come in better. If you look at GDP for the third quarter, you know, estimates keep going up. And what I love about economists is they always get it wrong, Kristen, and we made fun of them back in March. So we can continue to do that. And they can continue to discount just how good this recovery is. And my guess is you're going to see more of that. So that, what that translates into is more surprises in the positive, which makes me still very, very bullish on stocks. But again, I'd rather be diversified. And the international markets, too, are starting to go up here really healthily. Mm -hmm. Dollars weakening. So tech's not the only story happening right now as well. Uh, so I'd love to get your take on the options market, Ryan, because activity in the options market, specifically with SoftBank, did uh, factor into the tech sector's performance here the last uh, month, the last several weeks or so. What do you make of the options market and what is it indicating to you right now? It's indicating to me right now it's the greatest casino available <laughs> to people because sports betting has been on the decline because we haven't had as much activity in sports. And like platforms like Robinhood have made it so easy to trade that options volume this year is up 92% over last year, Christian. That's that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, so I made a joke earlier today that I think along with free trades, maybe Robinhood's going to start offering free drinks like they do at the casinos. <laughs> I digress. But the point is, you know, we're getting to a point now, it's just massive speculation. The options market right now is controlled by retail investors or small contracts being traded. And it's just basically buying momentum. What do you think is going to go up? It's kind of like betting on red at the casino. All right, Ryan, uh, you have to join me again. Always good to see you. That's Ryan Payne. He's the president of Payne Capital Management with some warning signs for this market.